Hey folks, welcome to the Diaries of a Problematic Artist. The title says it all, I am a toxic artist. I'll bet amateur, I've got issues. And if you clicked on this video, you might have issues too. This video is inspired by Bookish Realms, you're a toxic reader like me if you do this. I'll link her video down below, so give it a watch if you enjoy this one. I think you'll definitely enjoy her video as well. My name is Julie, and for those of you who are new, welcome, welcome. I am very much an amateur artist. I've been drawing and painting since 2016. I'm not very good but I love it. And I created this channel because I wanted to show that it's okay to really enjoy something despite not being skilled at it. It's all about the journey, you know what they say. I have a few encouraging videos on my channel about growing as an amateur artist, so give those a watch if you're in the same boat. Anyways, let's get down to the nitty gritty, mwahaha. I'm unwell, okay. <laughs> in many different ways. I've realized that I am a deeply bothered artist and you very well might be too. There are 10 things that qualify me as someone in this undesirable category. Number one, I'm lazy. Yep, I am lazy as heck. I don't practice very much. I don't draw every day or every other day or every three days. For someone who claims to love art, I don't partake in this hobby as much as I should. Listen, I've been drawing and painting for like 8 years now. Does this look like the work of someone who's been learning art for nearly a decade? I'll answer that for you, no it doesn't, not at all. And sometimes I get so damn frustrated at my lack of progress, as if it's not my own damn fault. The lack of personal responsibility is absurd at times. The worst part is, it's probably not going to change. If I haven't made my art development a priority after so many years, it probably will never be one. And I have to accept that my art improvement will continue to move at this turtle's pace, instead of being so sour about it. Look, in all seriousness, I'm happy with where I'm at. But those moments do wash over me where I question my abilities and get frustrated. It's not as common a feeling as it used to be, but it does happen. And I guess it's just a part of picking up a skill that you're not very good at, right now at least. And it'll probably stay like that for a long while if you're lazy like me. Number two, I throw out, burn, and cover up ugly artwork. I know the consensus is to keep every one of your pieces, to track your progress over time, to assess failed works, to see where you went wrong and where you can improve, but I just can't, okay? There is a point of art atrociousness that I just cannot invite into my safe space. And when one of those pieces manages to surpass the very low, mind you, threshold of acceptability, it can't even live out its life in one of my dark drawers. Just knowing it's there bothers me. Knowing that I might forget about said artwork and open up the drawer unintentionally to bring it to light, I don't even know how I'd process that kind of jump scare. It's just too much. I've kept plenty of ugly works, and I don't mind that word, ugly. I've mentioned it in a previous video, I don't believe that all art is inherently beautiful. That is some frou-frou bullshark. And I know that for certain, because I've created some objectively ugly pieces in my time. I am speaking from my own experience. For the most part, I look back at these works fondly, I've kept like 90% of my ugly artwork, and I do appreciate them. They make me smile knowing how far I've come, but that last 10%, mm, let's just perform a seance to erase them from existence. Thank you. I have to take a moment to let you know that I am fully aware that this is a hot mess. I don't really know how to paint with gouache. I'm slowly learning how to. Uh, I'm also slowly learning color theory. 
it'll take some time. So I've accepted that sometimes I'm gonna paint something and it's gonna look really bad at first. And then I'm gonna keep painting over it until I get the colors I like, until it starts to come together. I'll hope, I'll pray, and eventually, maybe like 40% of the time, I end up with something that I can be proud of. Not necessarily something that I love, not necessarily something that's good artistically, but just something that I can be proud of. So this is the stage I'm at right now. You're probably watching this and you're probably like, girl, what are you doing? This is a mess. I'm telling you, just trust, okay? Trust, it will come together. I, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> but I'm also um, panicking just a little bit, just a little. <laughs> Number three, I've gotten stuck in the very unfortunate loop of making art for social media. This one is actually a big one for me, and I know that a lot of you out there can relate to a degree. I'm not fully integrated into social media. I have literally zero posts on my personal Instagram. I don't do TikTok or X, <laughs> Twitter, X, whatever. But when it comes to YouTube, I've gotten trapped in the mindset of if I'm drawing or painting, I should be filming it too. I make art for the sake of a YouTube video more than I do for myself. In some ways, it can be motivating and in others, debilitating. Because if I want to paint something but I'm just not in the mood to film, it can sway me not to paint anything at all and just wait until I'm ready to record it. I enjoy art so much, but art isn't my life. I love cooking, working out, studying languages, and making YouTube videos. Filming, editing, scripting, and recording voiceovers takes me between 15 to 20 hours if I set out to post weekly, which I've been trying to do, but realistically, it's hard to fit all of that in. And I'm not even working right now. I'm currently looking for a job, so I don't know where I'll be with all of this once I actually do start working. The thing is, I really do perceive making YouTube videos as creative work in itself. Nearly every step of it involves a creative element. You're like creating a mini TV show all on your own. I think this toxic artist trait of only creating art for social media comes down to lacking the willingness to make more time for art when there's just so much else going on. And you know what? I am not willing to make sacrifices right now. Because if I make more time to make art for me, then something is gonna have to get pushed to the side and I'm pretty happy with my life right now. Number four, I'm deeply impatient with my art. I also work mostly with watercolors, which means through about 80% of the art I create, I experience at least one moment of knowing in the deepest pits of my soul that a layer isn't dry enough to paint on top of, but painting over it anyways. Dun dun dun. Then I panic and go into damage control with my paper towels while I watch horrified as colors bleed together. I curse under my breath as if it wasn't my fault. It's the paints, the paper, the universe. Guys, the amount of shameless denial is just not okay. I really want to know how you impatient artists do it when it comes to oil painting. I can't even imagine the level of frustration this medium would give you. Please share your experience. I really need to know what it's like because I just, I can't, I can't. To combat the level of impatience, I did buy a heat gun a few years ago. It's amazing, total game changer, dries my paint up real quick. The only thing is, see toxic trait number one, sometimes I'm even too lazy to grab it and plug it in. The absurdity. Number five, I am deeply ashamed of the art that I'm proud of. Yep, you heard that right. <laughs> I'll say it again. I am deeply ashamed of the art I'm proud of. Look here. I was raised by immigrants. If you know, you know. Essentially, 
I could think an art piece is my greatest one yet, but if you come into my art space and look at it over my shoulder, I will cover it up with the shame of someone who was caught doing something illegal. Shame is so instilled in me. I have to feel my pride in secret. There are very few occasions where I will show people my artwork and only to those who I share my deepest, darkest crimes with, I mean, um, secrets with. <laughs> those people and everyone on YouTube, of course. Something about being a random person on the internet just alleviates that pressure. The only people who know that I post YouTube videos are my family, but I don't let them watch any of them. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's simply not allowed. At one point, I even blocked my dad and brother on YouTube because I was worried they would get curious and watch. It's not just my family. I am deeply terrified that some random person from my past will watch my videos. It's literally one of my top social fears. I'm not even joking. And I really enjoy making videos. I am very proud of what I post on my channel, but I also just can't revel in it. Nope, not in public. <laughs> It's just not in me. Number six, I act as if collecting reference photos like Pokemon cards counts as practice. Yep, after delaying actually making an art piece by scrolling through Pinterest for two hours, I pat myself on the back for a job well done. Half the time, I don't even draw anything. Excuse me, por qué, why? I like to call this productive procrastination, which of course is a hyperbole. It doesn't make sense as a phrase to reflect how much it doesn't make sense in real life. It's one thing if you have an idea for an art piece in your mind and you're collecting references for it, but my version is scrolling endlessly on Pinterest and adding cool looking photos to random boards never to look at them again, followed by celebrating how incredibly driven and brilliant and bright I am. The boost in confidence is thoroughly undeserved and I genuinely don't mind. <laughs> I will bask in it. Number seven, oof, comparing. We all do it, don't deny it. I see you, come back out here. I think it's an incredible thing to have access to social media as an artist. It's such a great feeling to be inspired by people's works and to have artists to look up to. But having access to so many talented people can also wear away at your confidence. And this is something that beginners, amateurs, and experienced artists alike face. I like to believe that it happens less so the more experience you gain. For me, I get self-conscious about my art progress when I see someone who has only been learning for a couple of years and they've well surpassed the level I'm at. That makes me a bit insecure. The thing is, I can tell myself that logically these artists, whoever they are, put more hours into practicing than I have. That's all it comes down to. I could get to that level if I put in the time. Again, see toxic trait number one. But even when you can justify the difference in skill logically, even when you understand that skill improves with effort, it can still sting when you realize what you could have been had you had the same amount of motivation. Listen, it hurts. It hurts to think about where I would be in my art skills if I committed to serious practice. It hurts to acknowledge that I haven't made art a priority all these years. It really hurts to think about what could have been. For the most part, I see others' artwork as inspiring. It motivates me and makes me proud to call myself an amateur artist to be a part of this space in some capacity, but there are just those days where the comparison gets you all riled up. I think it's a very human thing to look at the people around us and to use them as a baseline as to where we should be. Sometimes I let it affect me more than I should, and I don't think this is something that will ever fully go away. There I said it. Toxic comparison is apparently here to stay. Ooh, I know you guys can relate to number eight. I'm so sorry. 
I have a history of hoarding art supplies, wanting every new marker set and palette that gets released, even though we have more than enough. Wanting art supplies that you don't even use often and having those supplies depressingly sit in your art space, longing to fulfill their purpose of being used, but not. I posted a video a while back called Stop Hoarding Art Supplies. I also published a blog post about it, which I will link below. I will say this video is overdue for a remake with updated thoughts. I do have one brewing, so stay tuned. I am a big advocate for not buying things if you don't need them. But even though I put so much emphasis on this in my day-to-day -day life, I still find myself wanting yet another student grade watercolor palette that someone reviews on YouTube. And it'll take me a little while to shake myself out of wanting something that I very clearly don't need. I'm trying so hard to swim away, but consumerism still has its little hooks in me. Again, I plan to make a video about this soon, but art supplies are meant to be used. They're not meant to sit there and look pretty. Like think about the food in your pantry. You don't call it a food collection. It's just meant to sustain you. It's the same thing with art supplies. They are meant to be consumed. I mean, in a different way, of course. Don't eat your supplies, okay? That would be one heck of a toxic trait. <laughs> Number nine, I eat my art supplies. Whew. Um, <laughs> no. Number nine, I'm shallow. I'm shallow solely because I succumb to the desire for an aesthetic sketchbook. How could you not want an aesthetic sketchbook after seeing so many beautiful sketchbook tours all over social media? Some folks put so much care into the artwork and layout of their sketchbooks. It becomes a piece of art in itself. I've always wanted a beautiful sketchbook. I've yet to create one. And I'm trying to make my current sketchbook read like a beautiful artsy scrapbook. I don't think it's working out too well, but I can't help but want this. The thing about wanting an aesthetic sketchbook is that sometimes you question the kind of art that you should be doing. Rather than using a sketchbook for its true purpose, aka practice, I put extra pressure on myself to paint something pretty, and I kick myself for creating subpar work. Listen, we need to create a space for exploration and the mediocre work that comes with it. Physically, we need to be able to practice a range of subjects, e.g. a sketchbook with its purpose being practice. But we also need to create that space for ourselves mentally. We need to be okay with making mistakes. We need to be open to learning. And that comes with going easy on ourselves when it comes to owning a messy, visually unpleasing sketchbook. A pretty sketchbook ain't gonna do all that for us, no sir. And finally, number 10, I have entirely on my own volition, allowed my love for drawing and painting to steamroll over my social life. And I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> if you asked me what I would do with an extra day of freedom, seeing my friends wouldn't even cross my mind. It wouldn't even be an afterthought. I would so much rather draw, paint, or edit a video. Literally anything else. And I adore my friends, they mean so much to me, but ever since embracing art as a hobby, my level of introversion has gone astronomically high. Why did no one warn me that drawing and painting would have such a big impact on my social life? Or I guess now, my lack of. <laughs> it's, it's not okay to be this okay with not seeing people. Granted, I do live with my mom and sister, we hang out all the time, but when it comes to the people outside of my family, I make plans maybe like twice a month. It's a problem, truly. <laughs> Learning to draw has affected me socially, and I don't plan on reversing the damage it's done. End of story. So there you have it. 10 reasons why I'm a toxic artist, and why you probably are too. At this point, 
Honestly, let's just embrace it. <laughs> and let me know what I missed. I know there are tons of problematic artist traits out there that fail to cross my mind. So please fill in the gaps in the comments. Maybe I'll even make a part two of this video if you guys enjoyed it. Lastly, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm about 400 watch hours away from making it back into the YouTube Partner Program. I was kicked out for being inactive for a few months, so I would really appreciate it if you check out some of my other videos. Put a playlist on in the background while you're drawing or cooking, cleaning. Let me keep you company. Any form of interaction would be amazing. Thank you so much. And until next time, stay toxic. I'm kidding. Stay creative. Peace. You know, I did my best. <laughs> I did my best. I don't usually paint scenes like this, so I'm actually pretty happy with how it turned out. Um, not 100% satisfied, for sure. Uh, I really do like how the tiles turned out. I like my sense of perspective. I feel like it looks all right. I don't know what's going on with her legs. I didn't really like how I painted the water here, but you know, overall, I'm pretty happy with it. I am an amateur artist, so go easy on me. I just draw for fun. I know I'm not very good, but you know what? I'm trying and I enjoy it. And for me, that's really what matters. But feel free to let me know if you have any advice on how to approach gouache because I'm just starting to get the hang of it and I still have tons of work to do. As well as advice for like painting scenes like this because normally I, I draw and paint random floating people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really used to this kind of art, but you know, I, I guess I am pretty happy with it. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. The birds are talking in the background. They're saying hello. <laughs> and until next time, stay creative. Peace.